the Redeemer is coming to Zion. Heavenly Father, if we knew tonight how close we are to the coming of Christ, if we really knew how short our time was, we would not hear, we would not be sitting here so nonchalantly in your presence. There would be a detachment from the world. There would be such a hunger in our hearts. We would be lifted out of ourselves into the very presence of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, I invite you to come now. Take over this service in a supernatural way that no flesh should glow in your presence, but that we would hear from the very throne of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, minister your word. Minister to us, Lord and give us hearing ears that we could hear what the Spirit would say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to bring you a prophetic word from the Lord tonight. The Redeemer of Zion is about to appear in his glory in our day in his church. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, now, the vision of Isaiah the prophet is about to be fulfilled. God is about to move with vengeance toward all who twisted the truth of the gospel and all who have become covetous. Isaiah spoke of our day. He spoke of the conditions in the church of the last days. He said, truth has fallen into the street. Yea, truth has failed. And he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And Isaiah is saying to us right now, let it be known that God is angry. Truth is being twisted and trampled upon. The church of Christ has become victimized by those who preach false doctrine. And God is displeased because no one will stand up and judge the perversions of truth. No one standing up to judge the perversion of truth. And it displeased him that there was no judgment. God's ministers were sitting idly by while the truth was being thrown to the ground and trampled upon. Lying spirits had found a voice in the church, and no one stood against it. True men of God refused to judge the false doctrines creeping in. Therefore the Lord said, I'll judge it myself. The Redeemer of Zion is going to come, and he's going to judge the carnality. He's going to judge our wickedness. He's going to judge our covetousness. And he's going to judge all the mockery of the truth of Jesus Christ in these last days. And he, the Lord, saw that there was no man. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. And he said, where are the men with discernment? Where are those who will show the people the truth? because truth is falling. Few people care, few people understand. And the Lord said, I wonder why. Where are the men who stand up and discern? Show my people the truth. The Redeemer himself is about to clothe himself with vengeance, the Bible said, in zeal. And he's going to move quickly to his church with fury and holiness. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation is on his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, the Lord says, I will repay. He's coming back to his church. Even now, the Bible said he's putting on the uniform of a glorious captain. He's coming wearing a breastplate of holiness. And he said, there's vengeance and there's fury and there's judgment, for the Lord shall judge his saints. The Lord shall judge his people. Something new, something awesome, something eternal is about to happen in the house of God. He said it's going to be sudden, it's going to be glorious. Now you've heard that the Bible predicts that in the last day everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But let's ask God now by the Spirit for an understanding. Why is he coming to his church with vengeance and fury? And why must the Lord himself return to Zion? 
Why is the Lord going to take the matter out of the servant's hand, out of the old minister's hand? He's going to take this matter of defending his truth. Why is he going to do it in his own sovereign power? It's all clearly laid out by the prophets. First of all, the Redeemer is coming to Zion because the enemy has come in like a flood against the church. The enemy has come in like a flood. The Bible, Isaiah said, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Satan in these past few years, especially the past five, maybe ten at the most, has been flooding the church with one new doctrine after another. There's been a spirit of covetousness and carnality. Satan has poured out a demonic flood of adultery and morality and filth. John the Revelator saw it coming. This is what he warned us. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth and persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. This flood of Satan is all at war against the true church, against the overcomers. And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We are witnessing right now the devil's final attack against the chosen, the very elect. The Bible said he will seduce, if it were possible, even the chosen of God. And Daniel suggests that for a season he'll prevail. For a season he'll be successful. The horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He prevailed against the saints until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints would possess the kingdom. I ask you now, is Satan prevailing for a season right now? Come on now, in the United States and Canada, I tell you, for a season Satan is prevailing. You and I know that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of Jesus Christ in the end. But is he prevailing for a season now? Has Satan established a beachhead in the church, a stronghold? Are many, many of God's chosen being deceived? What happens in the church to this woman in the wilderness? The Bible says, until the Redeemer comes with fury and vengeance. Satan will come with another gospel, the Bible says. And Paul told us exactly how he's going to come against God's holy people to try to deceive them. We're not talking about homosexuals and drug addicts now. Talking about overcoming saints of God. Talking about preachers of the gospel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Oh, that's awesome. Many will come in these last days who are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Satan's stronghold in the church in the last day is a host of teachers and ministers who have been transformed by a gospel of the flesh. They have come to us as the Lord's most enlightened ministers. They sound just like the preachers of the gospel. They freely use the name of Jesus. They speak of righteousness. They use the scripture. They cast out devils. They heal the sick in the Lord's name. They do many wonderful works. But their message is not of God. It's another gospel. It's a deception. It's of the flesh and it's not of the spirit. And many of these teachers have been so deceived by the devil, they're blind to what they preach. They're preaching lies and they believe it to be the truth. They're not even aware they're the tools of Satan. Do you understand that they are men who started out right, but they're transformed by the gospel they're preaching? It's doing something in them and to them. 
And right now, these false doctrines of Satan are prevailing in the church in many areas. Multitudes of God's people are flocking to conventions and meetings to hear this other gospel, this gospel of self and prosperity and success. The gospel of the flesh is riding high in the church. Come on, Christian, wake up. Are you and I being deceived? Have we been trapped into the teachings of an angel of light from Satan? Are you being swept away by this flood that the prophets told us would sweep the church and for a season would prevail? Get into God's Word and hear the true gospel of Jesus and begin to judge now what we see and hear and compare what Jesus said to what they are saying. The Scripture proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Satan's new flood, his new gospel, is gain is godliness. Gain is godliness. Listen to this. Clearly, if you don't hear anything else I say, hear this now. It's a compromising message without repentance and, or godliness. It, pro it promises forgiveness without repentance. All we offer people now is forgiveness. Turn on your television and listen. Happiness and forgiveness, it's all offered freely. No repentance. It's a gospel of gain. It's based on the supposition that the godly you are, the more gain you will have. Oh, listen to Paul's frightful warning. If any man teach otherwise, even other than the words of our Lord Jesus, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, that man is proud. He knows nothing. He's destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Paul cried out, turn away from them. Turn away from this other gospel. Do you want to hear the true gospel, Christian? Do you want to hear what Jesus really said in this day and age of success and prosperity preaching? Do you want to know what the gospel says? Are you interested? Here it is from the words of our Master himself. Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are you that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and they shall separate you from their company, and they'll reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Now here's what the Gospel says about people in these modern times in the church who are seeking after material things from the lips of Jesus himself. Woe unto you that seek to be rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did the fathers to the false prophets. The gospel of gain despises poverty. It rejects and despises the poor. Listen to what James said. He said, but you have despised the poor. You say unto him that's prosperous and dressed best with the gold rings and the fine apparel, sit up here in the good place. And to the poor you say, sit here in the low place. Sit at the footstool. This is a gospel of partiality to the prosperous and successful and it's an indictment against the poor to whom Jesus ministered. It exalts prosperity and success. James said, Are you not partial? Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? And for you preachers of the gospel who try to tell me that he became poor, that we could become rich in houses and lands, you don't know your Bible. There it is. It said, Hath not God chosen the poor? Rich in faith! How blind is the church today? How blind! Is this the gospel for a dying world? Gain is godliness. Faith is for prosperity. Poor people lack faith. 
Christ became poor so that we could be rich in material good. He came to give us abundant life. Is abundant life supposed to be worldly goods? No, that's eternal life. Abundant life is the fullness. You and I don't have the life. We have just the seed. The life is encapsulated in that seed. And one day we're going to have abundant life. And that's eternal life in Jesus. We don't have it now. We're going to get it then. One billion people on this earth are near starvation. The heart of Jesus is breaking over the sight of weeping mothers who hold starving babies with their bloated stomachs. Millions are unemployed. The ends of the world are coming down on us. The world's headed for Armageddon. Our cities in America and Canada are about to explode again in riots. Persecution and tribulation are coming. The Bible said the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. The world's on fire. All over the world, God's chosen people are being jailed. They're being persecuted. They're losing all they possess. They're taking joyfully the sporting of their goods. And you tell me that God's going to send a man of God to tell me that I have a right to be rich? Is that a man of God who comes to me in the face of a starving world and said, use your right, use your faith. You can be rich, you can be prosperous, you can have a bigger car, you can have a better home. What's happened to us? How blind can we be? You say that's an American message. No, it's seeping all over Canada right now. We got it all wrong. The rich man went to hell. The poor man went to heaven. From such, turn away. These preachers have no burden for repentance. They don't preach against sin. They offer blessings without sorrow. They are accumulators of this world's goods. They accumulate. Heard a preacher say, I have to be successful. I have to drive a nice car. I have to prove what I'm preaching. Makes me want to cry. Amos the prophet cried out, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, unconcerned about the evil day ahead. They lie upon beds of ivory. They stretch themselves upon their couches, and they eat the lambs of the flock, and they drink wine in bowls. And they are not grieved for the afflictions of Joseph. They're not grieved. And I shudder to think of standing before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, having preached that kind of a message. The Redeemer is coming back to Zion to break down every stronghold of the sate of Satan. And he's coming back to Zion to raise up a standard of truth. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. What is this standard that's going to swallow up the flood? What kind of sovereign fury is going to be released very soon in the church, folks? It's a sovereign fury. You can put all your books on Finney away. hundred ways to have revival. Put them away. This is a sovereign work of God to be released in the church. What is this vengeance the prophets are talking about? Hear it. It's the actual presence of God. The actual living presence of God. The church in these last days is going to experience God actually appearing in their midst. And the Redeemer shall suddenly come to Zion. That's the church. He's always come suddenly. He came suddenly at the day of Pentecost. He came suddenly to Paul. He comes suddenly, folks. One day it's not there, the next day it's here. He's going to suddenly appear in his actual presence. This time the judge is coming himself to the church. The general of the armies is coming. He's coming in power and awesome glory. Now you and I know that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in our presence, in our midst. 
But folks, that's like the ray of the sun compared to the heat of the sun. The closer you get to the sun, the brighter and the hotter. And the Lord said he's going to remove himself out of his chamber and he's going to suddenly come forth. He's going to appear in his church. The Lord will come who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and he will expose the counsels of the heart. Every preacher in this building, listen to me. Every evangelist, every missionary. You and I know God's not going to raise up a new prophet. The days of big time evangelism are over. They're over. Babylon's coming down. All the men who shine, they're not going to shine anymore. All the bigness, all the brightness, all self glory is coming down. And the Lord is going to appear in Zion's midst. There'll be no new revelation. Folks, there's no new revelation coming. You say radio, we've had radio for 50 years now. We've had millions and millions of sermons on radio and the world is still lost and America's undone. Television, no television is not the answer. That's a part of it, but that's not going to do it. We've had that now for 20 years. It still didn't do it. And we've had the best preaching in the history of the world. We have the best churches. We have all the machinery. Oh, no, no, folks. There's only one hope. There's only one hope left, and that's the awesome presence of God. God breaking through everything and coming in his presence to the church. We are going, we, I, I prophesy right here and now we're on the verge of a revival of the actual presence of God. The Holy Spirit's going to open the eyes of his people. He's going to pull the scales from our eyes. And you and I are going to come up against the terrifying presence of God. The earth shook. The heavens dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai was moved at his presence. And the Lord whom ye seek... Folks, you understand that we're so deaf and dumb and blind now we hear this and don't hear it. We have ears to hear and we don't hear. But I've heard it and I believe it. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He shall come, saith the Lord. And who's going to bear up on the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appear? Do you know that all the preaching of gain is godliness is going to melt in his presence? All the pride of success, all the secret hidden sin is going to melt like wax before the presence of God. The Bible said, as wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. For he is the refiner's fire. He shall sit as refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. The first thing he's going to do, folks, when he appears in his church again, he's going to work on the ministry first. He's going to sit as refiner of fire, and he's going to purge Levi. This is the ministry. And folks, I tell you, the day is coming. Whether we want it or not, he said, I'll manifest myself to those who weren't even seeking after my name. And God said, I'm going to remove out of my place, and I'm suddenly coming to my church. And oh, he's going to come in a melting power. Who's going to stand on that day? Who's going to glorify himself on that day? Who's going to talk about the church he built, all the ministry he's established? I don't care if you pastor the biggest church in the world. It's not going to mean a thing in the sight of God. doesn't matter. All idolatry is going to come down. For behold, the Lord shall come forth out of his place. He will come down. He will tread upon the high place of the earth, and the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valley shall be clipped as wax before the fire. Isaiah said, oh, that he would rend the heavens, that you'd come down, that the mountains might flow away at your presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the water to boil, to make thy name known to the adversaries that the nation may tremble at his presence. J. 
Jeremiah cried, Will you not fear the Lord? Will you not tremble in his presence? God said to Ezekiel, And all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and every wall shall come tumbling to the ground. <laughs> every wall coming down. Listen, if the ungodly are going to shake and tremble in his holy presence, how is anyone going to stand in the presence of God in his house? How are you and I going to stand when he appears? He said every wall is going to fall to the ground. Down comes all the boasting, all the books and teaching on success. Down comes all the idols of self, down with self-promotion, down with merchandising the gospel, down with all the thieves that are trading in God's house. His house will be a house of prayer, no longer a den of iniquity, no more seeking after the things of this world, no more squandering your faith on temporal things, no more trying to make a name for yourself because judgment's going to begin in his house. His presence is going to frighten and melt everything in sight. He's going to humble his servants. No minister will be allowed to boast in his presence. It's going to become fatal. Listen, it's going to become fatal to harbor secret sin. I believe we're going to see many whose flesh is going to be destroyed that their soul may be saved. People are going to die in the house of God once again that no flesh should glory in his presence. You say, how can you preach like that, Brother Dave? Very easy. I've had an experience like Paul had and Peter. I heard my summons a few weeks ago, and he told me in my time of departure, and at that moment I renounced the world and everything that's in it, and from that moment I knew what he said when he said, Many, many shall come on that day and saying, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils? Have we not healed the sick in your name? And he'll say, I never even knew you. And the other side of that coin is, You never knew me. Do you understand that? Not a few, but many, many, many who have built churches who have had ministries around the world and they were so busy they didn't take time to know him. And it suddenly dawned on me if I have my summons, there's only one thing left in this world that matters and that's to really know him. To know him because you and I have to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that, folks? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. And God's made it so clear to me he's interested more in winning all of me than he is in my winning all the world for him. Until he has all of me, I don't know him. And I tell you, the time is coming soon that God is going to break through in our midst. Preachers are going to get up and confess their sins publicly. I've already seen it happen. I received a call. The revival just broke out in Chicago. It's happening there. It's happening in California. And day is coming. You will not be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. You will fall on your face and you will confess your sins and no flesh will glory in His presence. You're going to have to flee like Jonah from the presence of the Lord. You won't hold your secret sin any longer. How many times has the Holy Spirit dealt with you? How many times did he say, lay it down? And the only reason you still flirt with it because you have not yet come into his awesome presence. I hear people say, oh, the Lord is moving in our midst. We have seen and felt the presence of God. Folks, you and I don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what we're talking about. If God was really in our midst tonight, I would be the first one down on my face. I couldn't preach. Every man behind me would be on his knees saying, God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I'm nothing. 
None of us could stand in this house. No one could go another minute without confessing, lifting his hands, crying out to God, your head wouldn't be in the air, it would be in the dust. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. His train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet. Do you understand that the seraphims couldn't even stand to look, so they covered their eyes? They were so ashamed of themselves, they covered their bodies. They didn't want him to look, and they couldn't stand to look in his face. With twain they covered their eyes, and with twain they covered their bodies. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And the message is, see the Lord and die. See the Lord and die. All success, all self-esteem, all secret sin, it's all going to vanish in his presence. It's going to turn to corruption. Daniel said, I lifted up my eyes, and I looked, and behold, a certain man was there clothed in linen, and his loins were girded with fine gold. His body was like pearl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were lamps of fire. And his arms and his feet like in color to brass, polished brass. And the voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon them, so they fled and hid themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and I saw this vision. There remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned to corruption. I retained no strength in me. Yet I heard the voice of his words. When I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, with my face toward the ground. And when he had spoken these words to me, I set my face upon the ground, and I became dumb. Couldn't say a word. When the presence of God comes in his house, people are going to stand and confess, or they're going to melt and harden themselves. We're going to cry, woe is me. I'm not a success. I'm not a winner. I'm undone. I'm Jacob's worm. I'm a proud man. I'm a proud woman. I know nothing. I have nothing. But for his blood, I'm damned. But for his grace, I'm damned. And then you'll learn to cry out with Paul. He's chosen the weak things of the world, the foolish, the nothings, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, finally, the Redeemer's coming to Zion to prepare his bride for the wedding. To prepare his bride for the wedding. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the infants that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of the closet. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. For his wife had made herself ready. She's arrayed in white and fine linen and righteousness. People, let me tell you what the real gospel is. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this. Put on righteousness. Lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets you. Don't become entangled with the things of this world. Go forth now to meet him. Get your lamps burning. Get your oil supply. Don't set your affection on things below, but on things above. Don't lay up treasures anymore here on earth. That's the gospel. I'll tell you why the Redeemer has to come to Zion with his presence, because the church is not ready to meet him. We're not ready. There's too much hay, wooden stubble. 
going to burn. God made this so real to me. He's been speaking to me night after night, saying to my heart, I've got to come back to Zion. I've got to have people face my presence now, lest there be no hope for them when they stand there. Because, folks, if we don't allow the fire of his presence to burn out the dross, if we don't allow him to burn out the sin and the pride now, how do you stand before him? I had a beautiful, last week, a beautiful six-hour experience in the Spirit. When he laid me down and said, come, the Spirit said, come. And I found myself racing through the universe, past the stars, in an outer darkness. But there was no fear because I was racing further and further out into eternity. And suddenly the world was so small, there was nothing left. It was nothing but a speck out there in space. And the further out I got toward his presence, away from the world and all of its beggarly elements, the more I was crying, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I have nothing, I've done nothing. I could feel the utter nothingness, the emptiness, and I could say, it's only grace, it's only mercy. That's all I have, grace and mercy. And that's when the Lord said, David, there's something more important than your ministry even, more than your family and everything else, and that's to know me. To know me! We have to have this presence of Christ revealed to us now before we go to judgment, and we cannot stand there. What's it going to be like to stand before the judgment seat? It's a private chamber as far as I'm concerned. Forget the masses this time. You can put them at the great white throne. And just he said, I stand one at a time at the door of your heart and I knock. You're going to wait outside his chamber, Christian. And he said, some of us are going to suffer loss. Do you remember when Satan took Jesus to the mountaintop and showed him in an instant all the powers of this world? He said, you can have it in an instant there before his throne. And you'll know as soon as you enter that presence and he opens that door and you're ushered in and there's nothing there in that chamber but the judge, Jesus Christ, the judge whose eyes are a flame of fire and you suspended in space. Nothing, no place to stand. Nothing but his grace and his mercy. And he shows you all you've done. And in a moment of time, he builds your world again. And he shows you your motives. And he said, see, you said to my glory. But it was to your pride. You built your empire. And not my kingdom. Every secret sin, all that was confessed, but still holding, clinging on, besetting you, vexing you. And that's going to be the greatest revelation of grace that you could ever receive. And how many, many thousands in the church of Jesus Christ, and even ministers, because that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination at times to the Lord. Some of the greatest known men on this earth are going to stand there naked with nothing, nothing, nothing. They're going to be stripped naked. And they're only going to say, mercy, Jesus, mercy. Oh, you'll get his grace, but you won't get his glory. I want more than grace. I want the glory. Jesus said that they may see my glory, which the Father has given to me. Folks, he's going to manifest his glory. We're going to glow, go to glory with glory in our hearts. The glory is coming back to his church. And when that glory appears, remember what Jesus said to, to Mary. He said, did not say to you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Folks, do you want to spend your faith on something worthwhile? He said, did not tell you, if you would believe, if you had faith, you'd see what material blood and know the glory. That's where I'm going to spend my faith. God said, you're going to see my glory. You're going to see my glory. I've already touched 
I've already felt it. Do you understand that your cars that you drive 20 years from now, so Jesus, chair going to be on a heap somewhere, just rusting away? Do you know that your house and everything you own is going to melt? Do you know the only thing that you have now that's worth anything is the knowledge of your saving love and grace? That you and I have nothing more to give to Him but our love. I will glorify the house of my glory. Arise and shine, Zion, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is upon you now, and that glory shall be seen upon thee. That glory shall be seen upon you. All people are going to see it. What was that glory that Mary and Martha saw? What was the glory? It was resurrection power. They saw a man come out of a tomb. Folks, after all these years, he's finally seen fit to show me what his resurrection power means. I'm not talking just about that day that he's going to come for us and take us out of the grave. Oh no, folks, I'm talking about resurrection power right now. I'm talking about being raised from the death of self and pride. I'm talking about being transformed into the kingdom of God where your soul is possessed with Jesus, where you want nothing more in your life than to truly know you are glorifying his name, that every word you say and everything you do is pointing to his majesty and his glory. We need a resurrection, a revelation of his resurrection power in the church right now. I've canceled all my meetings. I felt led of God to take this one. I've got next week three more and that's it. And for the next five months, I've got a little prayer chamber and I'm going to wait because I'm repenting. And I'm falling on my knees. And I'm saying, oh God, how many times you've come to me and said, now, make your move. Go all the way. Humble yourself and seek my face. And how many times we go so close and then we quit and we say some other time. And I'm so grieved at what I've seen around the country and around the world. I've preached in some of the largest Assembly of God and Pentecostal churches in the world in the past six months. One pastor of a large church told me he hadn't prayed in one year. He has devotions every day, but he doesn't pray. We've got men so busy running around the world trying to win the kingdom for God. But where are those? Where are those who shut themselves in and hear that sound of the trumpet? You understand, people, you and I are not ready. You're not ready. Now, folks, I can say some things in that because I've got nothing left to lose. I've got nothing to prove to anybody. I've already been given my divine detachment. We're here now in his unbelievable presence. And I'm going to bring you what I feel the Holy Spirit told me to tell you. This is the reason I came. Maybe you're not relating to everything I'm saying yet. But first to the Pentecostal Summers of God in Canada. If all the leaders and all the pastors and all the people, lest you and I repent, he's going to remove your candlestick. He's going to remove it. And you pick him up a people who are given totally to his love. You put away your professionalism. You get back to the cross. You get back to the secret closet. You humble yourself. You go back to the meekness that you once knew. 
you go back to the sense of his sovereignty saying not my will anymore but yours I've got a neighbor who got his summons two weeks ago well known young singer in America Keith Green he lives next door to me his plane came down 12 people killed 27 years old I talked to Melody his wife the other day she said he got on the plane and said honey if I don't come back raise Daniel for the Lord and suddenly he goes up 15 seconds later he's down the plane burst in flames and the bodies dissolved couldn't even identify the bodies <laughs> oh folks we live like we're never going to die There's some pastors here tonight that need to repent. In just a few moments, he's going to move closer. He promised me that he'd give us just a little taste of his presence. He's going to appear among us. He's not going to let you sit in your seat comfortable anymore. He's going to bring you back. In the moment you feel His Spirit breathe on you, humble yourself. Just come and stand in His presence. Say, Jesus. I want to know you. He's going to tell you, you did so much in my name, but you didn't take time to know me. You didn't take time. You so busy, you didn't take time. You became a stranger to me. You used my name, but you didn't know me. I don't care whether you think I'm a mystic or not. because I'm just as much at home over there as I am here tonight. I've already seen his face. I don't want anything this world has to offer. Oh, I'm going to occupy till he comes for me. I'm going to work. But you understand that you haven't been given any more time? You've only been given the hour that you're in right now. You don't have a promise of getting out of this building. Every one of you could be summoned tonight. Now you think about that. If I only had four or five more hours to live, when I go into the judgment chamber, and I appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, I'm going to stand. He said that you may be presented faultless with exceeding great joy. That's what he wants. The Lord wants on that day to reach out and say, come on, my child, come on closer. I know you. You know me. We are one. Come, my brother. Come, my sister, into my presence. Folks, that's what I want. I want him to embrace me on that great day. I want to be embraced by the Savior himself. I want him to reach out of that judgment seat and say, David, come closer. My son, come closer. Because he said, you're going to be known even as you know. What you're doing right now depends, oh, it depends on what it's going to be like on that day. You're going to be known as you're known right now. Are you close to him? Do you know him? Are your sins really forgiven? Have you forsaken? Have you repented? Are you looking for his coming? Have you set your affections on things above? Are you still so earthbound, so interested in yourself and your ministry? In what you're doing? Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Exalt yourself. Let the presence of Almighty Christ come. Holy Spirit, bring Christ. Reveal Him in our presence tonight. And don't let anyone walk out of here tonight carrying pride or self or sin. 
Humble us, humble us in your presence. Holy Spirit, turn your flaming eyes on us and let us see now the judgment must begin in the house of God. You do love your people. You do love your children. You're getting us ready for your coming. You're getting your bride ready. And you do love us. But you said to the church, repent. You said to the church, the seven churches, repent, repent, repent. This is the conclusion of the message. The power of the presence of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Lord, we come now to take absolute authority over every principality and power of darkness. Anything that would hinder the word of the Lord from going forth tonight. Lord, we thank you there's power in your presence. In our lives and in the church, on the streets, wherever we go, there's power in the presence of the Lord. We pray, Father, you come now. Let the Spirit of the Lord rest upon us. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say tonight. Move upon us mightily. Shake us if you must. But God, get this truth into our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The power of the presence of Jesus. It's an absolute necessity that God's people have and maintain the presence of the Lord at all times in their lives. Folks, I don't think we're going to be able to make it in the days ahead without the constant abiding presence of Jesus in our lives. We're going to have to have it. And he's going to have to be manifest in our lives. We're going to have to have that continual, awesome presence of Jesus in our lives. Those who don't walk in this presence and who do not have his presence are going to be an easy prey for the devil in the days that are ahead. Now, this is the only power that Satan runs from. That's the power of the presence of Jesus. Satan and all his demonic hordes are absolutely fearful of the presence of God, the presence of Jesus. For the Lord God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. The scripture says, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate thee flee from before thee, him, as smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of the Lord. Let the wicked melt, let the power of the enemy melt in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says they shall perish at the presence of the Lord. And the word used there for perish means the enemy shall be trapped. The enemy will lose all power and effectiveness. And the word also means to fail in the mission. The devil has a mission to come and destroy you. He has a mission to come and deceive you, to bring guilt, fear, condemnation upon your heart and cause it to live in fear. And the Bible says that when you have the presence of Jesus in you, the enemy is made ineffective. He fails in his mission to deceive you. That's the power of the presence of Jesus. Now, folks, uh, the presence of Jesus is the only thing that I believe overpowers the demonic powers that come against us. I want to tell you something. You can spend all day trying to cast out demons. You can say in the name of Jesus. You, you can, uh, you can uh, threaten them. You can say, go in Christ's name. You can pray over people. But those demons are just going to laugh. They're not going to go unless in you is the abiding presence of the Lord. The power is in the presence of Christ and in his name. But you can quote his name and say, in Jesus' name, go, and the devil's just going to laugh at you. If you do not have his presence abiding in you, if you are not filled with his presence, he will not move. Paul was so full of the presence of Jesus, the demons fled, even when from his body were brought to the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. And the Bible said the evil spirits went out of them. It was not the power in the apron. It was that this man was so full of Jesus that anything he touched, anything he touched, radiated the presence of the Lord. Out of his life came rays of the presence of the Lord. There were some vagabond Jews, seven sons of Sceva, a priest. And they, and, uh, they, they, they said they took upon themselves to call over them that had evil spirits. And they said, we adjure you by the 
the Lord of Paul to depart. And the scripture said, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? And those spirits leaped out of that demon-possessed man and began to, to tear them apart and wounded them, and they went fleeing and bleeding because they had no presence of Christ in them. They had not power. They had the formula. They had the name. We have a lot of people that have formulas today. They say, you speak the right words, and everything's going to be all right. You have power over the devil. You can make things create. You can create things by word power. Folks, it's all foolishness unless you have the power of Jesus in your life. Unless Christ is abiding and there's this wonderful power of Christ radiating in your life. The evil spirit leaped upon them. <clears throat> Peter was so full of Jesus, the demons didn't even get, want to get near a shadow. The scripture says they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them uh, on couches and on beds that at least... The shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. And they brought sick folk, and they were healed, every one of them. Folks, it was nothing that was in Peter himself, not in his flesh. But this man spent so much time with Jesus. It just radiated. It was not his shadow they were they were being healed by. It was the radiating power of Christ. I, I think that even though there was no shadow, you could go ahead of Peter. you get near his presence, and there was something about him. Same with Moses when he spent time with the Lord on the mountain. He spent so much time in the presence of the Lord, it, it came on his face. It just radiated so the people couldn't even look on him. He had to put a veil over his face because it frightened everybody. They had to run from the presence of the Lord. It's just that he spent so much time in the presence of the Lord, it radiated in his countenance. Now, folks, it doesn't radiate on our face, but it radiates in our hearts. Those who spend time with Jesus come out of his presence, radiating that presence. Hallelujah. There's an amazing passage in Psalm 71. Don't turn there, but 71, uh, it says, in fact, I want you to turn there to Psalm 71, if you will, please. I want to show you an amazing scripture. 71st Psalm. Psalm 71, verse 10 through 12. Uh, let's start verse 9, in fact. Psalm 71, verse 9. This is David speaking. He's an old man now. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. For my enemies speak against me, and they that lay waste for, wait, wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God have forsaken him, persecute and take him, for there's none to deliver him. Persecute and take him, because God has forsaken him, in other words, look at me, folks. You know what the enemy, you know what the demon powers are saying against David? And David is praying this now. He's saying, oh, God, don't forsake me because I have not been resorting to your presence as I ought. And the enemy saw that because David had explained up to this time, he said they, they wanted to know David's secret of strength and why God never put him to shame before his enemies. And I want to tell you something, that's a heritage of the children of God. That if you walk in righteousness before him in full confidence, and, and, and you, you, you are not holding on to your sins, but you're saying, Lord, every sin that I have, everything in my life, I bring it to the light. Give me power, give me deliverance, and you bring your sins to the Lord, and you walk in his presence. I want to tell you something, not only do you get the favor of God and the blessing of God, but the wonderful thing is that he'll not put you to confusion before the face of your enemies. He'll never bring you to confusion. He'll never put you to shame. God never brings his children to shame. Do you understand that? Now, there may be people ridicule you. Your name may be cast in the mud, but he restores and he will not allow your name because your name is connected to his name. His name is dragged in the mud, but he'll not put you to confusion and he will not bring you to shame. And that's what David said, the secret of all this, he gave it, he said, because the Lord was my strong habitation, and I live continually in his presence. He said it was because I walked with him, and his presence was with me at all times. That's why my enemies never triumphed over me, because I had the presence of Je I had the presence of the Lord with me. But now David has come to a place where he's weary, his strength has failed him, he, he I don't know if he is walking, uh, in the presence of the Lord as he once did. But he, he said, the enemy has the idea that God's forsaken me. So the enemy says, persecute and take him, 
for there's none to deliver him. At this time, it seemed like his strength had failed completely, and the enemy got the idea, David is weak now, he's frail, let's pounce on him. Let's get him now while he's down. That's exactly what Absalom's counselor said when David was running from him, when Absalom overthrew his kingdom. His counselor, Ahithophel, said, let's go upon him while he's weak and weary. And that's how the devil tries to come against you when you're weak and when you're weary physically. Maybe you haven't, you, you have been so busy, you haven't had time to spend praying and seeking God as you ought or want to. And the enemy comes in a time of weakness to try to destroy. And that's when it says, the devil says, Let, let's take him because there's no one there to deliver him now. The presence of the Lord is not there. When David sinned, his one great prayer was, remember, oh God, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, David remembered what it's like to see a man who had lost the presence of God. Remember when Saul lost the presence of the Lord? When he sinned against God and he was established in his stubbornness? The Bible said the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. All God had to do from, with, with Saul was to withdraw. And when he withdrew, the enemy saw that said, let's take him, let's possess him. Folks, it's a dangerous thing to lose the presence of Jesus. That is your protection in the last days. To, to be totally enveloped in the presence of the Lord. To have him so, have your heart so full just by spending time alone with him. By trusting that when you spend time with him and you're alone with him, that he fills you with himself. And when you come out of his presence, people are going to know it. I can tell when people have been praying. I can tell when people have been shut in with the Lord. Then the scripture said they took notice of them that they had been with Jesus. It comes out in your conversation. It comes out in your countenance. Now, it doesn't mean you run around with a crazy, silly grin all the time. But it, but it means that there's a sweetness about your countenance. You're not grouchy. You're not grumpy. You're not jumping on people. You're not gossiping, you're not slandering. There's a sweetness, there's a gentleness of Jesus. Because whatever's in you is going to come out of you. Whatever's in your heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the Bible said the mouth speaks. And David was called in when Saul was a madman. You know, the Bible makes it clear, if you read in Samuel, that if he came to the place where this evil spirit was so strong upon Saul that he would go raving through the palace as a madman and into the wee hours of the morning. And David would come in with his harp and he would play. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The Bible said this man was full of the presence of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord was upon David. And when he came in, he played his harp. That evil spirit in Saul would be calmed. It didn't leave, but it would calm down, and he would be calm and quiet. It was not David's music. It was not the harp that made the difference. It was the presence of the Lord in David. When David came into the room, the very presence of the Lord, the devils couldn't raise a voice. They couldn't touch him. They had to be quiet. They had to be silenced. Folks, when the, pres the manifest presence of Jesus comes down here in Times Square Church, I guarantee you that every demon, every evil spirit, every principality and power of darkness flees from this place. <laughs> David had seen Saul, the horrible devastation that came, how he lost his protection, how he lost his favor of God, until finally D Saul winds up consorting with the witch, and his testimony is, God doesn't talk to him anymore, not by Urim, not by Thummim, and he doesn't speak to me by the prophets, he doesn't speak to me, he never appears to me. He said, God has abandoned me. He, he wound up a man who never did hear from God again. He had to run to a witch. David saw that, and when he sinned, the thing that he feared most is that the Lord would take away from his presence. He said, oh God, don't take it away from me. He knew his protection. He knew where his strength came from, that it was the presence of the Lord in his life. Folks, that's your power. That's my power. The presence of the Lord Jesus in our lives. Hallelujah. Now, the Christian who is full of the presence of Jesus needs no other protection from the enemy. That's the only protection you need. Now, I want you to go to one of my favorite 
chapters in all the Bible. Zechariah, second chapter. Zechariah. Now, if you get to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament is for new converts. Turn left one chapter or one book and you have Zechariah. If you're in Malachi, you went too far. Zechariah, right after Haggai. The second chapter, and I want to show you something. I want you to follow me now, folks. This is one of my favorite chapters. Let's read the first uh, five verses. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Now listen to this, folks. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be under her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Now, folks, this cannot possibly mean natural Jerusalem over in Israel, because there's never been a time yet that Israel or Jerusalem in the flesh, the natural Jerusalem, has not needed to depend on the arm of flesh or the wall of flesh. It's still depending on dollars from the United States and the rest of the, and in Europe, wherever uh, money is sent and wherever we, we send arms to Israel, I'm in favor of all that. I have no problem with that, but that does not fulfill this prophecy. Zechariah is talking about a spiritual Jerusalem, the mother of us all, the heavenly Zion. And the Bible says in the last days, there are going to be a people who don't need to depend on human walls. God says you don't need those walls. The only wall you're going to need in the last days, no matter how wicked the time gets, no matter how evil the time gets, no matter how many demon powers are released, there's only one protection you need, and that's the wall of fire around you. That's the power of the Holy Ghost in the middle of that fire. There is a Shekinah glory, which is Jesus Christ, in the middle of that wall. Hallelujah. Now, there are a lot of people in these last days erecting their own walls. Let's talk about those who have a besetting sin, for example. You've been fighting that besetting sin. You say, I, I, I don't know what to do, but you, you, you get so uptight, you said, i tell you what I'm going to do. I am going to win over this if it's the last thing I do. And so you grit your teeth and you begin to build a wall of willpower. You said, if, if I just have enough willpower, I will not be tempted again. I will get victory over everything in my life that is unlike Christ. I will get rid of anything that grieves the Holy Spirit. So you're going to bite the bullet. You're going to make promises. And you're going to dig in. And you say, Lord, I don't want to live like this. I don't want this thing in my life again. I don't care if it was drugs, sex, alcohol, whatever it may be. Any habit of the flesh. It can be gambling. It can be so many, many things that touch the flesh. And you say, I guess I'm not trying hard enough. I guess I'm not putting enough resistance into this. So you start building this wall around you. And you may go for a week and two weeks, maybe even a month. And you say, I think I've got it licked. You've built this wall around you. And you, you say, this wall is going to stand. I think I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. You used the wrong words when you said, I'm going to do it. Because the next temptation is going to blow your wall down. They're going to huff and puff and blow your wall down. It will come tumbling down and then discouragement sets in. No, the Bible said that's not the right wall. He said, I will be to you a wall of fire round about you. A wall so big the devil can't get over it. So hot he doesn't want to touch it. He can't dig under it. He can't fly over it. You are under a wall of fire. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. These fleshly human walls are not to be depended upon. The Bible says the hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Those hills represent that thing that stands in your pathway when you're walking for Jesus and suddenly, I don't know whether it's a temptation, a trial, uh, a hardship, and there it is right in front of you. A hill is erected by the enemy. And you can't get around it. You can't get over it. And there you, you look at that mountain in front of you. 
And what are you going to do? Try to dig your way through it? You can't dig your way through any mountain or through any hill. But the Bible says, all these hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Folks, you can go into the secret closet of prayer, looking at the biggest mountain you've ever faced. It can be a mountain of debt. It can be a mountain of of uh, need. It can be a mountain of sin. It can be all kinds of mountains. And you go into the presence of the Lord, and you say, Lord, this is bigger than me. I can't do it in my own strength. I may win for a week or two, but I'm going to fall. I'm going to fail. You've got to acknowledge your dependency on the Lord. You've got to admit that you are weak in the flesh. Folks, your flesh. God doesn't deal with your flesh. Don't you understand that at the cross he did away with everything had to do with the flesh? That that, that flesh, some people have the idea that, that when you get saved and sanctified, God is reforming the flesh. He, he, he is working on your flesh, making it better. No, God doesn't make your flesh better. He does away with your flesh. There's a new man, a new man of faith that's wholly dependent on the Holy Ghost. Wholly dependent on the blood of Jesus Christ. That old man in you is flesh. God doesn't deal with that old man. He said, you can't make him any better than he was. He will always be bad. He will always be full of lust. That's the old man. You put off the old man and you put on the new man which is by faith in Christ Jesus. Your old man is always going to be lusting against the Spirit of God in you. That old man, God doesn't deal with. At the cross, it was crucified. And Jesus, if you walk by faith and you come to him and say, Jesus, I, I walk under the power and the protection of the blood... You, you speak to me, Lord, about my sins. You talk to me about all my weaknesses. And you come and empower me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a desire to walk in holiness. Give me a desire to please you, O God. Even the desire has to come from the Holy Ghost. And if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. Oh, what a wonderful thing to live free from the power of sin. But oh, what a horrible thing to try to do it in your own strength and in your own power. It's the presence of the Lord. That's why we urge you, run to Jesus every time you're in a problem. Run to Jesus when the devil slaps a hill in front of you. Run to Jesus and just get so much of the presence of the Lord. You'll come out of there and that mountain will melt. That which looked impossible when you went into the presence of the Lord... You go in and you touch the hem of his garment. You go in and get an embrace from Jesus. Stay there till he touches you. You're going to come out of there looking at that hill and you'll see that it's gone. God can remove those mountains. He can remove those hills. The very presence of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. The Lord's presence is our wall of fire and the glory therein. Now, folks, we... We've looked at this. That's one of my favorite verse uh, passages in all the scripture. I told you that. But the Bible says, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. I think that's verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come. I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. I will dwell in the midst of thee. My presence, he's promised to give his presence. And Jehovah will possess Judah and make choice of Jerusalem. That's verse 12. Now, look at me, please. I want to explain something before we get further. Everybody. And Jehovah shall possess Judah. And, and in the original, it's me, the Lord shall Shekinah upon Jerusalem. I've spoken a few times from this pulpit about Shekinah glory. The Bible speaks of the Shekinah glory. He that hath my commandments and Keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved to my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself. And this is called Shekinah. I will Shekinah myself. I will give myself to you. And what it is, is an explosive radiation of the presence of Jesus. It's an explosive, uh, sudden bursting forth. In fact, it is mentioned in the story of Daniel. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are told to bow down before the idol and, and worship the golden idol, and they refused, and the king 
It says, heat the furnace seven times hotter. And the furnace is heated seven times hotter. And here stand the three Hebrew children. And what a story that is. What a tremendous story of standing against all the opposition of the age. Even the other Jews, the other Hebrews from other countries that are there, they're all bowing. These three men said, we will not bow. We're going to walk in righteousness before our God. We're going to do what our God tells us. And the king watches as as his own men that are feeding this furnace die from the blast of heat. And he watches the old man being carried away. And I believe when the king made that statement, he didn't believe the Hebrew children would go through with it. And I, I see them standing there resolute before the king. And the king is saying to his associates, are those fools literally going to do this? I don't think he ever intended that, that they would go into the furnace because later you, you see the impact upon this king. And he, he knew that they were with Daniel and he admired Daniel. He never anticipated that they would go this far. The orchestra begins to play and the devil puts on the biggest fear show you can imagine. What a fear show it is. He's trying to make them afraid. And the orchestra's all playing. Everybody's on their knees, bowing before this. And all the pomp and ceremony. Here stand these three Hebrew men of God. The devil's trying to scare them to death through pomp and ceremony. But there's something in their heart. They're ready to die. They're ready to meet the Lord because they had the presence of the Lord in them. They were full of his presence. And I... I, I, Here the king said, all right, I don't know how long. I'll bet that orchestra played for an hour or longer because that king just waiting. I hope they melt. I hope they melt. I hope they don't go into that furnace. What a stupid thing. And those resolute men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, stand firm, and they are cast into the furnace. And even the men that cast them in the furnace are slain by the overwhelming heat outside the furnace. And they're thrown in it. The crowd are standing there. I, I think most of us say, I wonder what the smell of flesh smells like. And all the thoughts of that crowd is these three Hebrew children are being cast into that. And the Bible said they fell down. They're being, ba- they're bound hand and foot. They're, they're, they fall in those, those, those white hot coals. They just fall on them. And all of a sudden, there's a burst of light. And, 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 uh, the king is astonished, wondering, did their bodies explode? What was it about it that they're exposed? He's looking in. There was no explosion. There are four men walking in. You know what he saw? He saw the Shekinah. He saw the glory of Jesus. That was Jesus in that furnace. A blinding light. And he looks in. He said, did we not cast in three? There are four men walking around. My granddad, Wilkerson, he was, he was so vivid. When I remember the boy, he was so vivid. He'd preach on, uh, the three Hebrew children, a, a lion, and, and, uh, the fiery, fiery furnace. And he would get that hot, he could explain it so well. And he'd hide behind the pulpit and he's throwing these men in one at a time. And explaining it. And, and everybody in the car, and every kid, I was there, I was, ooh, and an all, and then finally the last one goes in and I'm going like this. My grandpa made it so, and then he talked about the blinding glory of the Lord, and everybody in church was shouting. I pointed like my grandpa, but I'll tell you one thing, folks. I know what happens when the Shekinah glory of God comes down. Nothing can hurt you. Not even the smoke was on their bodies because of the Shekinah glory of Jesus. He was the fourth man in the fire. We've had a taste of this kind of glory tonight. It's a wonderful thing when Jesus comes down and manifests himself in our midst. But that's not enough. He wants to be manifested. He wants the Shekinah in you. Now, folks, the Shekinah glory is not just the presence of the Lord. It is the presence of the Lord magnified many times. It's an, it, it is just an explosive radiated radiation of his own self. And that... Folks, is possible. That's what Zechariah is talking about. There'll be a wall of fire around you. And he said, I will be the glory they're in. Not only are you protected, but you're going to have my blinding presence in your life. Folks, I've experienced that 
a number of times in my life. When I get alone in prayer, I explain one experience I had with a Shekinah glory years ago. Just being shut in with the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And you sense His presence. You know He's in the room. Just as sure as another human being were there. You know that Jesus is in the room. Have you ever... I, I, I've had that where I would try... The presence of the Lord was so powerful, I would just be laid back in my bedroom, on the floor, and try to get up. And I'd feel this hand gently put me right back down. And Jesus would be there and say, I'm not finished. Just stay still. And I'd get up, and it was so beautiful, so wonderful to feel his hand, and feel his warmth, and feel his presence. I would start laughing. You talk about holy laughter? That's holy laughter. And I... I would just laugh, and it, I wanted to feel it again, so I, I'd get up, <laughs> back down. I wanted to stay there all night, having his hand put me back down, because I was laying in his bosom. He was just coddling me. He was holding me. He was breathing life into me. He was shekining into my spirit. There was a glory from the Lord, and finally I got up one time, and it was gone. I felt like dying. It was awful. I thought, oh God, don't leave me. It was so wonderful. I felt like I was in heaven. Have you ever waken up, awoken, in, awakened, awoken? <laughs> Did you ever wake up in the middle of the night and suddenly you realize Jesus was in the room? Come on, how many have had that experience? And, and you say, Jesus. Jesus, you're here. You don't have to look around because he's filling the whole room. Some presence of the Lord expecting some blinding light all the time or the kind of experience I'm talking to you right now. You shouldn't be looking for the experience. You should just be looking for his presence. You say, Lord Jesus, I can't go on without you. I can't fight my battles without you, Jesus. I can't go on without you. I can't even go to work tomorrow without you. Don't go to work in the morning without him. Don't go anywhere without him. Don't come to church without him. <laughs> Moses said, if thy presence go not with me, carry me not up from here. Let me stop right here. I'm not going anywhere without your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. Now, not every Christian has a wall of fire around them, and the Lord does not Shekinah on every temple. We are the temples of the Holy Ghost. Not every Christian has his presence, because there are some conditions. Very quickly, I want to go over these conditions. Condition number one, this promise that he will Shekinah comes only to those who have come out of Babylon. Because if you read the 12th, the second chapter here, verse 6. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north. That's Babylon. Thus saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. Deliver yourself. The Shekinah glory, the presence of the Lord, is reserved for Christians who have completely come out of the world, out of the Babylonian system. Folks, I'm shocked. I am absolutely shocked at what's happening in our churches today. There, there, there are, on the West Coast, there are churches where many uh, are sitting in that congregation that are in theater. They are in television. And you see them raise their hands and worship the Lord. And then, then you, go, uh, uh, you hear, if you have television, you see them the next night on a program that is off color. You, you see them on programs where there is cursing and take, God's name taken in vain. And I don't understand pastors say, go for it, go for it. That's the favorite expression, go for it. No, if, if you're going to have the Shekinah glory, you don't go for it. You come out of it. You come out of the world system. Folks, we, we, have, we have, our whole time we've been in New York, we, we have come against... The world system. We have not said to homosexuals, stay in your homosexuality. We say Jesus loves you 
but he hates your sin. And God will not put up with your sin. You come out of your sin. You'll never be comfortable in this church if you're going to hold on to your sin. We've said to those that are in show business, if you are in anything that, that brings reproach to the name of Jesus, you cannot maintain his presence and then be a part of that which mocks his name. We've taken that stand and we believe it. It would be easy if, if we just softened up on that to have all kinds of show people in this and we could have some, have some well-known people sitting all through this congregation because we're not going to deal with their sin. No, folks, the Bible says, come out from among them. Be ye separate and clean, saith the Lord. Then I'll be a father to you. You want my presence? You come out of the world. You come out of the world system. You shouldn't be, folks, you shouldn't be running away. You shouldn't be running around to all these theaters around here. Do you dare go into a theater where the name of Jesus is mocked and ridiculed? And they curse the name of Jesus and you sit there and you want the presence of the Lord to go in with you and out with you? The Bible said we are to live even as he himself lived here on this earth. The thing you should ask is, Jesus, would you go this way? Would you sit here where I'm sitting? Would you do what I'm doing? That's... The, that's the criterion. If you want the presence of the Lord, you come out of the world system. You forsake it. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate and clean, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Then I will receive you and will be a father to you. Now, secondly, this separation from the world has got to be at any cost. No matter what it costs you, there has to be total separation. People say, well, Lord, you can't expect me to give up this particular thing. All my life I've wanted this. All my life I've waited for this. And, and now you expect me to lay this down? Folks, there are people I know that have been in this church, some of them from, from, from theater, from show business, and from other careers, and they have wanted something so bad it's become an idol to them. And the thing that they're doing is not clearly righteous. And they, they would rather have that than the presence of the Lord because they've waited so long. The Lord may be saying to you about something he wants you to lay down. And it, the, the, the time is going to come when you're going to have to put on the scale this thing that you want as versus the presence of Jesus and to see which way you're going to go. I, for one, can't put anything on this side that's going to outweigh the presence of Jesus. I want His presence at all costs, no matter what it costs, I want His presence. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. One final thing. The Bible says it requires the putting off of your filthy garments. Chapter 3. Go to chapter 3 in Zechariah before I close. And I'll read just first four verses. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before an angel of the Lord, Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he said and spake, unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. Folks, look at me, please. Do you want the presence of Jesus to abide with you all day long when you wake up in the morning till you lay down at night, and even when you wake up in the middle of the night, consciousness of the presence of Jesus, that he's with you, that he's walking, when you're on the street, when you're preaching on the street, testifying on the street, on the job, wherever you may be, to be conscious of the presence of Jesus in your life. You're trusting on it. You're leaning on his presence. All right, some of us need a change of garment. And folks, it's pride. It's pride. I didn't know it. Uh, lately. The Lord's been dealing with me with one area in my life of pride. I didn't know. Uh, the pride of wanting to be accepted of men. Wanting the approval. Not, In other words, uh, to have the congregation like me. Now you say, well, that's natural. They have, to have you respect. But folks, if, 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 if I stand here and I want that so badly or I feel that I need that, 
And I don't know how it is for you. You may want the respect of the people around you on your job, wherever it is, and, and, and you, you just fear losing. It's not that you're making an idol, but you fear losing it. And Lord showed me the fear of losing the favor of man, the blessing of man, the fear of losing that is pride. And some of you may have that. I'm dealing with that in my life, and God showed it to me. And, and I talked to uh, a, a godly person today explaining this, and this godly person said, well, Brother Dave, the Lord showed me that that's right. You do have pride in that area. I said, well, I didn't need to hear that from you, but I accept it. <laughs> I'd rather God tell me than somebody else. <laughs> You don't want me to come up and tell you that you're proud, do you? But the Lord was trying to put an exclamation mark on what he was saying to me. Sometimes people will put that exclamation mark. God said, you better listen. So pray for me on that, will you? Uh, but putting off that filthy garment. Because I don't want anything in my life that's going to hinder this wonderful presence of Jesus. Hallelujah. Folks, you see it. You see it in Brother Carter when he stands up here. What a wonderful radiance of the Lord that comes out from this man of God. He shuts himself in the Lord, with the Lord. He prays for hours and he comes out of that room and it's just, it just uh, wonderful. Sometimes when I've been praying, the Lord's presence come down in the room so much. Gwen will be on another side of the, the, the place and she'll come knocking on the, my door of my office and just say, can I come in? It, it starts drawing. There's a drawing. Drawing. Hallelujah. It doesn't draw people to yourself. But the, there's a draw. Even the sinners around you, it'll draw out of them the need. Now, let me tell you, Christian, before I close. The Lord said he's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. It's not enough, though, to go through life. I know I'm saved. I know I'm forgiven. These, these gentlemen, uh, we have three or four in the band here that are songwriters. They're writing songs right now. They wrote songs for a wonderful uh, children's album that's coming out next month. It's one, I've been hearing it. new songs are coming out. They're doing all new songs for the Christmas program and everything. And when these men sit in front of that little machine, the computer, and writing and think, I pray for these men. Lord, let your presence so come down upon them that out of the... Out of that presence comes the work of the Holy Spirit, comes the anointing, comes the words that begin to flow out. Uh, saying when the choir is singing, that they'd be so full of the presence of Jesus that uh, even if a few were off key, nobody'd notice it. No, I'm not saying anybody's off key. No, don't wonder is that me he's talking about. And all our elders and everybody that's a part of this ministry. Do you know that if you would come with this kind of glory in your heart, if you would come having spent time alone with the Lord, no pastor having to say, go pray and screaming at you, but you just had, you, you say, I know I need his presence. Folks, do you know if you have his presence, it makes you a day? It makes, it makes you a day? Makes you a week? It makes you a life. Every one of you fellows who are on drugs, when the enemy comes in like a flood to flood you, you stand still and say, Jesus, I know you're with me. I don't, right now, I don't have to feel some happy feeling. I don't have to feel a chill down my spine. I'm going to trust that you said you never leave me. So come right now, Jesus, and fill me with your presence and drive out the enemy. Hallelujah. And folks, with this, I close. An old temptation comes on you to stand still and say, Lord, you promised never to leave me, never to forsake me. You said you'd go with me to the end. You said that you'd be my wall around me. Lord, that's the only wall I have. If that fails me, I have no hope. I trust in the wall. Folks, trust the wall that's around you. You have that wall of fire around you right now. But folks, Jesus is in the middle of that wall. Get along with him. Get along with Him. Spend time with Him. It's that simple. Go to Him with everything and say, Oh, Jesus, I want to go to church so full of your blessing. You don't have to have come and have the choir pump you up. 
You don't have to have the round pump you up. Because you come pumped up with His presence. You come with the glory of the Lord in your heart. Let's stand. How many know that's where your power is and your, your protection, your strength, the power, the presence of Jesus? Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Sadly, there's some of you standing here tonight that once had the wonderful, wonderful presence of Jesus. You just so loved to, through the day. You loved his word. You loved his touch in your life. But you grew cold. Something's happened. Look at me, folks, please. There are a number of you need to walk down this aisle right here tonight from the balcony and here in the main floor and say, Brother David, I've lost somewhat of the sense of his presence. And I don't want that. I want his presence. Folks, I sense his presence all over me. Right now. His presence is with me right now. He's been with you all through the preaching. He's been with you through the hearing. He's here now. He wants to encourage you. He's going to say, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. He's not even going to yell at you for not having spent the time right now because he's patient. He's here to draw you out to himself. If you feel like you have lost ground with the Lord, if you feel you have lost something of his presence, I want you to get out of your seat. Some of you may have grown very cold. Maybe some of you are not even walking with the Lord. I want you to come. Step out of your seat and come. And let's believe the Lord. I'm going to pray for you tonight and believe the Lord to come with the, the wonderful, wonderful healing of his presence in your heart. He wants to heal your spirit. He wants to heal your heart tonight. <clears throat> Please. I, I can't begin to tell you how much the Lord himself wants to come and manifest himself. To you. He said, "If you, he that loveth me, he that hath my commandments loveth me. He that loveth me, I will manifest myself. I will Shekinah. Do you know, he's, he said, my commandments are not grievous. You know what those, the, how you can fulfill all those commandments? Number one, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, and love your neighbors yourself. He said, you fulfilled all the law. It's based on love. Can you stand here tonight and say, I love God with all, I love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul. How many can say that right now? I love Him with all that's in me. All right, how many of you can say right now, God helping me, I love my neighbors, myself, my brother, my sister, I love in Christ's name. Raise your hand. I love I have a love in my heart for people. I have a love in my heart for the brotherhood. I have a love in my heart for blacks, whites, for, for all colors and all creeds. I have a love in my heart. Hallelujah. He said, my commandments are not grievous. And I'll tell you what you do then. Release your faith. And believe what he said. You see... The one thing that pleases him is that without faith, it's impossible to please him. It's the one thing he wants from you and from me, faith. I have faith that he, he will bring me out of all roots of pride. That he will absolutely take the pride out. He'll do that for you, whatever it is that's in your heart. He can pluck it out. So there's nothing standing there. I want you to know he doesn't hide from his children anymore. He doesn't hide his face. He'll not hide from you. He, he's looking at you full face. He's not mad at you. He wants you to just humble yourself before him and say, Jesus, I'm going to confess everything, and I'm going to trust you that your presence go with me, and I want to spend time with you, quality time. And when you do, that glory that is his radiates. It's a mirror, and you begin to reflect that glory in your heart. It's heart to heart. Heart-to-heart -heart talks, heart-to-heart -heart communion with the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, you can if you have an hour to go to work, or you have an hour to come to church, you have an hour to be shut in with the Lord, I don't care if there's a thousand people around you. You can shut yourself out. Close yourself in. You can have a revival meeting right there. You can have time with the Lord. He's, he, he doesn't wait till you get into some secret closet. He's with you always. He said, I'll go with you always. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Do you believe that in your heart? Do you really believe that in your heart? I'll go with you to the end. I'll not forsake you. Pray this prayer with me. You that are standing in the front, pray this with me. Jesus, I ask for cleansing. Cleanse my heart and my mind 
I confess all my sins, everything that's unlike you, remove it from my life. I want you, Jesus. I want your presence. I want you to abide in me, and I want to abide in you. Come, Holy Spirit, fill me and touch me. Jesus, draw me to yourself, and I'll come running to you. Help me to understand and help me to believe that you'll never leave me. You'll go with me to the end. Now, just in your own words, thank him for that. Lord, I thank you 